We're coming to you live from Aptos, California. Hey, everybody. Thank you. It's wonderful to be back. Uh, if you're newer among us, you might not actually know me. Uh, my name is Todd Milliken. My wife, Hillary, and I pastor the church here, and it is a great joy to be back among you. Uh, we just about six weeks ago had our fifth little baby. So we've got one of the commandments, you know, the first commandment, be fruitful and multiply. We're having trouble with the rest of them, but that one we got tagged. Uh, so uh, anyway, it's going great. Our little one, Zeke, is growing happy and healthy and just packing it on, man. He's like double the size he was just six weeks ago. And believe it or not, he's already just got the cutest little smile. So we are utterly delighted. So thank you so much for supporting Hillary and I and uh, enjoying life together and especially those who we brought along for you to enjoy while uh, I was off supporting Hillary so she could be in fully in babyland. I got to be mom and dad for the other four while she was focused on him these last weeks. And also during the weekends, uh, the last few weeks, I got to enjoy being on the other side of service, uh, hanging out in children's ministries. It was really great to get to know a lot of your kids and uh, support what was going on down there while uh, others were bringing the word here uh, in the sanctuary. So love all you guys. Super excited to be back. On that note, open up your Bibles, if you would, to Acts chapter 4. We're going to be continuing on with this series that began several months ago. I like really long series, apparently. Um, and we'll wrap this one up in the next few weeks, but uh, we're just getting to the good part. I love, especially First and Second Peter, my goodness, such a, some of the greatest books in the Bible. We'll get to those in a couple of weeks. But for right now, Acts chapter 4, we're going to look at this episode uh, early on in the book of Acts. After the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the church is just thriving and growing. And uh, the episode that we're about to look at happens after Peter and John the, uh, perform this miraculous healing on this guy who's sitting outside the temple. He's healed, and then the city is just in an uproar because he's been sitting outside the temple begging for decades. So the whole city knows this guy. He's, he's been sitting there for ages. So everyone knows this guy as the lame guy who sits by this particular gate. And so when he's healed and he begins praising God uh, and speaking that it's, you know, it was done in the name of Jesus, oh my goodness, the whole city is in uproar because it was just several weeks earlier that Jesus had been crucified, and we thought this was a done story, but apparently it's not over. And uh, the religious rulers in particular are quite frustrated about all of this. And we're going to pick it up, Acts chapter 4, starting in verse 5. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? See, they couldn't exactly charge them with a crime. See, there was no law in Judaism against healing a lame guy. Does this make sense? Uh, so they had to try and catch them in some crime other than the healing. Uh, and so what they're essentially going to try to do is get them to say yes. Uh, it's, uh, it's either to back away from it and say, well, you know, uh, so sorry, you know, didn't mean to cause a ruckus. Or to go ahead and confess, yes, we did it in Jesus' name. He's been convicted as a criminal and then they will be somehow culpable of something. But in any event, that's the reason why they're asking that particular question. Not that they don't know the answer, but they're trying to pin something on these guys or get them to back down. But look what happens in verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we're being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. So we 
pick up this story and what the religious rulers are going to try to do here in, in, this, in this episode is to silence these guys. We want this story done. This guy, Jesus, was threatening our control. He was becoming more popular than us. The people liked him a lot better than they liked us, so we did away with him. But oh my goodness, this story is continuing. The whole city is just as much in an uproar as they were when Jesus was here. Let's get these guys in here and you know, intimidate them into silence. But it doesn't really work out that way because instead of cowering, you see what happens. Peter and John absolutely launch and go for it and they go on the offensive. I remember uh, over the last couple of years as I've been coaching my kids' soccer teams from time to time, there comes a moment, it, it happens several times, when the, one of the kids on the field gets turned around and he thinks the goal is on the other side of the field. And it's always, I, I'm always a little panic struck at the moment because I so badly want to get the kid to realize his mistake before he actually puts the ball in the goal. But there's something a little bit delightful about it because the kid's eyes just light up so much because it's so much easier to make progress down the field in the wrong direction. I mean, they're just cutting left and right and picking up speed. They're like, here I go, here I go. And thankfully, you know, each of the times this happened as I was coaching uh, these teams, the parents and the coaches were all yelling in unison, you're going the wrong way! And somehow it would break through before actually they, uh, they scored on our team. But um, I think that can really happen to us. We can, get, we can get mixed up, we can get turned around, and we can end up in that same posture where it's a lot easier to make progress going the wrong way. Uh, in, 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 how this was working in my brain as I came up with this idea of we're on offense, not defense. The, the defensive posture is taking care of myself, uh, watching out for myself, taking care of what seems like needs to be taken care of rather than remember, remembering everything. As Jesus said as he was on the cross, remember what he said as he was hanging there, it is finished. Everything that needs ultimately doing in our lives is done. And everything that God invites us into is advancing that victory that has already been won. So he invites us to be on offense, pressing forward in victory. He says, I'll take care of you. I'll be your protector. I'll be your provider. I'll worry about all the stuff that would concern you. Remember Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Don't worry about yourself. I'll take care of you. But what he does ask us to be interested in, what he does ask us to be invested about, what he does ask us to be concerned with is how can I make a difference in someone else's life? How can I go out there? How can I preach the gospel? How can I share the good news that because Jesus is risen, we have nothing to fear and yet everything to fight for? Let's live life to the full, not back on our heels, but pressing forward because God has good things in mind. He wants to strongly support all who belong to him. And his most common encouragement, his most common command by a factor of like triple, more than any other instruction in the New Testament is don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I've won. What I did on the cross, I took everything that could ultimately defeat you. I nailed it to the cross. When I came out of the grave, Jesus wants to say, I came out with power. I came out with the ability to rescue you from anything and everything that could ever hurt you. So the only thing to really concern you with yourself with is how can I advance that victory that was won on the cross and secured as Jesus came out of the grave, how can I advance that victory? And when we're on our heels, when we're worried and afraid and overwhelmed and discouraged and depressed or, you know, whatever, that sense of overwhelmedness, I think you know that feeling that I'm talking about, when the fog of dread just, oh no, oh no, 
Some of us wake up with that feeling. It's, it's on us as soon as we open our eyes. Our heart rate, our blood pressure begins to spike as, with our first thought. For some of us, it hits us at different points in the day, and the triggers can be so numerous. It can be relationships that we're afraid that we're going to lose. It can be finances that seem like they're falling apart. It can be the fact that a career isn't going the way that you think. It can be, who knows? It could be the headlines. I mean, there's some scary ones out there. So fear will come. It will come at us. But that's not the posture that he invites us to live from. He wants to do for us what I and those parents did for the kids and the team. You're going the wrong way. (laughs) Even if you get the ball into the goal of self-protection. Wow, I made it another day. Wow, doom didn't strike today. You haven't actually scored the goal that God wants you aiming toward. (laughs) Because he had that one covered. Some of you are familiar with the, 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 the spiritual armor that God's given us. The breastplate of righteousness and the belt of truth. The shield of faith, the helmet of salvation. See, God's got us covered. He says, I'm going to protect you. I'm going to protect your mind. I'm going to protect your heart. I'm going to protect you on every, in every way. What I want you to do, the one tool I've put in your hand, the sword of the Spirit, I want you to go out and make a difference. I want you to fight against the forces of darkness. I want you to fight against injustice. I want you to stick up for the little guy. I want you to go out and speak words of hope and life and truth. I want you to love the unlovable. I want you to pray in hopeless situations. I want you to believe for that which seems impossible in the lives of your friends, in your neighborhood, in your workplace. I want you to fight for your family and fight for your kids. I want you to press in faith that God's going to make a difference in your life and in the lives of those around you. But see, this defensive posture It gets us back on our heels. How does it work? Because instead of thinking about how do I advance the victory that Christ has already won, I'm safe, I'm secure both now and forever. Instead of living in that reality, that defensive posture that is all about fear, it gets us on our heels because we begin worrying about who? Me. Right? (laughs) Right? God's made a lot of promises about what he's going to do for you, what he's going to do for me. He's given a lot of instructions. Don't worry about you. Now, I'm not here to speak condemnation (laughs) because this sermon is a whole lot easier to preach than it is to live, right? I mean, a lot of us could get up here and say this stuff. Come on, people! Let's not fear. But I'm like you. I live the same life you you do. And man, sometimes that fog of fear, that pressure, that, I mean, I, I know all these truths. I love them. I preach them. I try to hold on to them just like you do. But sometimes it just feels like fear just comes in like a tidal wave. You know, I'm just, I'm just drenched in it. It's a wave that's so much bigger than me that to say, oh, Jesus raised from the grave and so you don't have to be afraid. And oh, by the way, Jesus commanded you not to be afraid. It's like, yeah, right. Do you see the tidal wave that's coming over me and you're telling me to just not be afraid? It's a tidal wave of fear. Everything in my life looks like it's going in the, you know, down the tubes and you're saying, don't worry about it. It'll all be fine. It ain't so easy, is it? Like saying to someone, 
in a bathtub, don't be wet. You know, it just doesn't always work that way. So Jesus never, when he gives this instruction, he says again and again, my peace be with you, peace be with you, don't be afraid. He does this not with condemnation, but because he recognizes we need fresh encouragement, we need fresh reminders that he is with us. This is not a, hey, come on, snap out of it. It's a, hey, remember, this is not the posture that God works from. He works out of the victory that has already been accomplished. And what releases his power in our life is when we choose to believe, God, you're going to do what you have promised. And so, Lord, I want to see. I love the the guy's response when Jesus asks him, you know, do you believe I can do what I've promised? And he says, uh, one of the guys in, in the gospel says, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. This is our reality. God, I do believe, but we can be honest at the same time. Help me, Lord, where I'm struggling. Help me where I'm struggling. Uh, So let's look at, uh, over the next little bit here, let's look at how did this actually work? As I'm saying, the tidal waves of fear will come, but what do we do uh, when it actually hits us? If you're following along in the outline, I'm now on the back side. So starting off, I find it interesting, after the resurrection in John chapter 20, twice, When Jesus shows up, he finds them behind locked doors, hunkering down in fear. Remember, they're in Jerusalem. They're trying to figure out what in the world just happened. Uh, Jesus has been crucified. There's rumors of resurrection, you know. Uh, But they're afraid that the same Jewish leaders who just went and crucified Jesus are going to come hunting after them. So they're regularly locking the door because they feel hunted. Whether they are or not, we're not exactly sure. But in any event, they feel afraid that they are being hunted. And so Jesus regularly shows up behind these locked doors. My boys love that detail. What, he just showed up? Well, I guess that's how it it works. With a glorified body, you can just walk through walls. Looking forward to seeing what that's all about on the other side of glory. But in any event, twice in chapter 20, he shows up behind locked doors in his first encouragement there in verses 19. And then again in 26, he encourages them, peace be with you. And again, you don't see any hint of correction there. He's just refreshing them with his peace. He's reinstilling them with confidence. I am with you. And I believe that's what God wants to do for all of us this evening. I am with you. My peace is with you. My spirit is with you. And I have won the victory. So don't walk in shame if you're living in fear. Just feel invited out of it and recognize God wants to give you a power to be buoyed out of that water so that you, like him, like he did, can walk across the top of it because your circumstances may not change. The circumstances may still feel threatening, but we live in a world that needs to know God. And when they see you walking through circumstances where you really ought to be afraid and yet you walk with peace and confidence, that is what will prompt the questions, what is up with you? And then you get to face a whole other kind of fear as you have the opportunity to share your faith. (laughs) But that is a subsequent invitation. For now, it's just you will never share your faith when you're cowering in fear because there's no one will ever ask you what's different about you than me. Because there's nothing different. When you're cowering in fear, you're living like the world. This is how the world lives, day to day, driven by fear, driven by performance, trying to secure themselves. And we are the ones with the good shepherd who watches out for us, takes care of all of our needs, leads us beside still waters so that we can rest and enjoy. And it is meant to be that there is an entirely different quality to our life because we know that we know we're taken care of. I'm taken care of. So we can have a peace. We can have a joy. And most importantly, we can have a love that transcends what the world knows how to offer. Because again, when we're afraid, we have a very hard time loving And anyway, in John chapter 20, they're behind locked doors a couple of times. Jesus encourages them. Then flip over to the book of Acts in verses uh, verses 4 through 5 of chapter 1. Uh, Remember this part where um, 
Jesus ordered the disciples not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Now, what's interesting is he is commanding them to wait in Jerusalem. This is like probably their last option that they would prefer. Like, Jesus, can't you please send the Holy Spirit to Galilee? You know, where our homes and families are and where we're not being hunted? Wouldn't that be nice, Jesus? Couldn't you do that? But Jesus is challenging them directly in the places where they feel afraid. They feel terrified. I don't want to be in Jerusalem. Stay in Jerusalem. Come on, Jesus. (laughs) Can't you lighten up? He's like, I have a lightness for you. I have a joy for you. You're never going to get in on it by running away. Stand up in faith and believe that I have overcome he who is in the world. And I am with you. And I am in you. So you need not be afraid. He calls them to wait in Jerusalem. Of course, there's strategic reasons of what he wants to do, you know, with outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Absolutely. There's some cool stuff that's about to go down. But it has something to do with inviting them to press beyond their fears and step out in faith, to grab hold of his promise, to watch out for them, protect them, and ultimately fulfill his promises. So that's what happens uh, later on in those verses. But look what happens. They're in an upper room again. Of course, they're in the upper room, I, I think, to, to pray. That's what happens in these verses. But I think they're also in the upper room because the door is probably locked. We don't actually have the detail again, but my guess is the door is locked again. But notice what they're doing in verses 13 and 14 of this same chapter. They are now with one accord devoting themselves to prayer. They're together and they're praying It's different than what we saw in chapter 20. They were together, but they're hunkered down in fear. Now they're together. They might be hunkered down behind a locked door, but they're praying, God, we want what you have for us. And this is what I think God's invitation to us as well, is when we feel that tidal wave of fear coming over us, that we would press into prayer and say, God, I feel afraid. I feel intimidated. I feel overwhelmed. And your word says, I don't have the strength on my own to stand up against this. You know, the Bible actually says we can't do it without his empowerment. That's why he invites us to pray. He doesn't want us to be fooled into thinking that it all worked out or that, wow, man, I'm glad I pressed through that. It's not about you pressing through it. It's not about me pressing through it. It's about us admitting, God, I am weak, but you're strong. So, Lord, would you show me your strength right now? Would you deliver me from this oppression? And when that prayer is not quite seeming effective, when you're praying it on your own, invite another to pray for you. Sometimes you're so overwhelmed with the intimidation and the fear that it just feels like I can't even get the words out of my mouth. You just are collapsed in a heap. You're in the fetal position. You need someone else praying for you. The enemy wants to tell you, you can't pray. You're hopeless. But see, you can always cry out to Jesus. Romans chapter 8 says, there is no power in heaven or hell that will keep you from the love of 